first session of a new campaign and I didn't kill anyone this time. Hey everybody, it's Nick and we played the first session of my new uh, D&D campaign this past weekend and I wanted to tell you fine folks all about it. Uh, I want to be able to introduce my new player characters as well as the new players who are playing them and talk about what happened, what I intended to happen, um, maybe mistakes that I learned. I want to kind of go through thing by thing and say, this is first off the story of what happened, start to finish. So if you just want to hear the story, awesome, that's that. Then let's talk about the specific things I was trying to do with this session, the things, I, the beats I was trying to hit, the things I was trying to implement, and then also just the generic, uh, you know, general things I'm trying to improve on as a DM and how I feel like I I did in all of those areas and then through the whole video I'll just be peppering in just generically these are things that I learned things that went well stuff like that so let's go ahead and jump into it talk about who my players are and just kind of go around the room and introduce you to the players so first we have Jason. Jason is a returning player from the previous campaign if you followed that he played Callister mostly so should be really fun watching him play again. Uh, this is Terrace is his new character. He's a half-orc uh, monk, open palm, open hand monk of, uh, he's like, he's very loyal to and serving Bahamut and sort of uh, all about Bahamut, which is very interesting. So that is uh, Jason's character. Then we have Walter. Walter is a brand new player, both to my table and to D&D in general. He is playing a Hexblade Warlock uh, Tiefling. So he's pretty cool as well. Uh, they're all pretty cool. I could just skip saying that. They're all really cool characters. I'm really excited to play with all these people and they've made awesome characters. That's really exciting. Uh, after that we have Charlie playing Varus, the human thief rogue. Uh, he's sort of a bit of a really classic edgelord. So it's going to be very interesting. He's a brand new player to my table and d and It's going to be very interesting to see how that develops into a real character. He's the one I'm sort of most nervous about because he is playing sort of a classic edgelord and that sometimes doesn't go well. So I'm, I'm sort of ready to work closely with him to see if he's going to run into any problems We're working with the party and, and being productive and all those things or being too lone or edgy. And uh, so that's something I'm keeping an eye on, but so far it seems like it's okay. Then we have Jared. <clears throat> Jared is a returning player. He played Tico the Monk, and he's playing a bear. Yep, a bear. Sort of like a brother bear situation. He was a person, and he's transformed into a bear. He is now a cleric. He's actually a space domain cleric. It's a homebrew that we found online, thought it'd be really cool. And he is, his patron, his deity, is actually the constellation Ursa Major. I thought it'd be really cool to have a constellation be a deity, and I pitched that to him. He thought it was awesome. Uh, it's very uh, sort of a Greek mythology that the constellations were entities and had their own desires and goals and things like that. And so um, he is playing a, a bear, uh, sort of with the long-term potential goal of maybe he would ascend to demigodhood and become the constellation Ursa Minor, which doesn't exist in the stars right now. So I just thought it'd be really interesting to have him go that avenue if he's going to be a bear. So, um, but yeah, he's a bear. He can talk. He's a bear. What are you going to do? From there, we have Evelyn. Evelyn is new-ish to D&D &D and brand new to my table. She is playing the uh, elven cleric Azarin, a uh, light domain cleric, so it's pretty cool. Uh, lots of fire, pyromancy type stuff, uh, very interesting backstory. She was one of the first people to send me a fleshed out backstory uh, with all of her, like, character questions sort of answered. Was very excited to see that. Uh, looking forward to you know, watching her as a player. Very exciting. Uh, then we have Hunter. Hunter played the gunslinger Travis last campaign. Hunter is now playing Wilhelm, the uh, Gith, Great Old One Warlock. Yeah. So he is going full on Far Realms extra planar. It's going to be uh, really interesting. I had to develop a lot of my extra planar nonsense uh, for him so that he would have stuff to play off of. But uh, look forward to seeing where this character goes as well. All right, so let's just crunch through the story of what happened in my game. So started off with a sort of a narrative introduction. I wanted to just sort of read a scene of dialogue that I uh, had made up for my players. I can actually just post the link to the Google Doc below if you want to see what that was, read along with it. I also posted the video of me sort of acting it out um, previously, but if you want to read through all the details of that, 
it's down below in the description. Um, but it was just setting up the sort of central tension, the idea of this conflict between the nation of Ocran and the rest of the world, honestly, and what normal common people who are about to experience this war might think about it and the different positions that they might have about it. So uh, we set that up and, and started that introduction, and then we jumped to the players and had them sort of introduce themselves to one another. Uh, after they introduced themselves, they're sort of waiting in this room, sort of they were told, hey, come here and wait in this room. And they were told also that they were joining a special combat group or they were gonna be tested to join a special combat group, um, a secret combat group, and what's that gonna be like? And all the players, of course, knew they're signing up to be this special forces team. And so they're sitting in this room talking to each other and and then this group of individuals bursts in. They're well armed and armored. A lot of their stuff looks like it's like personally or finely made or even magical, maybe both. Uh, these are powerful, confident warriors and leaders and know what they're about. They introduce themselves as the Raptors and they've got this, these cool code names and uh, call signs, things like that. And they're incredibly derogatory towards the players, like you're never going to pass this evaluation, but whatever, we have to do it. And the only reason you're here, if you do pass this evaluation, is so that we, the Raptors, can do the real missions. You guys will be doing menial, nobody stuff. So so don't get your hopes up for any glory or anything like that. We're going to just evaluate you because we're amazing and you're terrible. Very much uh, set that up and then dumped the players into some combat situations and just said, hey, this is the evaluation for this special combat group. Jump right in. Here are some fights. Uh, I like doing fights right away in a campaign because you've been Sort of sure you've been thinking about your backstory for a long time, but you don't know how that's going to really like play out and manifest itself. Um, but you do know what combat is. You do know how the numbers work, and you've been looking at your features and abilities and dice for who knows how long, and you're just ready to jump in there and attack some things. And also getting sure the, the new players could get acclimated to combat and things like that was really important. So we always want to jump into combat pretty quickly in my sessions. Uh, it's just how I roll. Feel free to do it a different way. So I wanted to start off with a really easy fight. I wanted to start off with, it was like a bunch of wolves in there and sort of an easy fight. It wasn't really a threat to anybody. It was just sort of setting up like, hey, can you even fight? And and from a, you know, a story perspective, it was a, are, are you like, are you even supposed to be here? Like if we're supposed to bail you out from this super easy wolf fight, then you're not ready to hack it here. The players are all fifth level, so these wolves, I think I used the warg stat block, but they were wolves, whatever. Um, they breeze through them, no big deal. Uh, one of the cool things that did happen from that fight is Walter playing, I'm really trying to get the names uh, learned here. I have them as, as my notes, but I want to try to remember. I got this, I got this. Walter is playing Sorel. I didn't have this. Walter is playing Sorel, and he has a really cool, clever idea to cast the spell Major Image to sort of block off the other wolves' line of sight so that he is in isolation with one wolf. And, and then he sits down and starts petting and talking to this wolf really calmly, feeds it some jerky, spends some time, rolls very well on some animal handling checks, and sort of tames this wolf. And it was one of those things where where Walter said to me, hey, is there a way that I could like tame one of these wolves? And I never want to just tell a player, no, you couldn't do that. Or yes, just roll this die and it can magically happen. Especially if they have a cool creative idea like that. I want to foster that creativity in my players. And so I was like, I'm, I'm not saying no, Walter, but you have to come up with a way that you would do that. How would Sorel try to tame this wolf he met five seconds ago and is trying to attack him? How would you do that? And you just sit back and you watch this player's gears turn. It was so cool. He came up with major image and he cast a wall sort of around himself. So it was mostly just him and this wolf 
with each other and he and as part of the major image I don't know if the spell can actually do this but I was very lenient with it because of what it was trying to do he sort of made a, a suit for himself so to speak he like uh, put on an, an outward illusion over himself of of a much like brighter colored and uh, more friendly looking uh, individual he kneels down and he uh, sort of offers some some jerky and just lets the the wolf come to him. He spent like two or three turns just doing this, not attacking anything, telling his friends to leave this wolf alone. Um, and I rewarded the heck out of that. He rolled very well. I gave him advantage on animal handling checks. He got like a 19 or something like that on, with a very low modifier, and uh, was just was just really impressed by his desire to do this cool, different thing. Most of the time, you get a new player uh, or even a veteran player, and they walk in and it's like, "Cool, wolves, kill them all, moving on." And there was a player who wanted to do something new and different and creative, and and I was like, absolutely, I'm going to reward this. I'm going to uh, absolutely uh, encourage you to do this kind of thing. So uh, that was a very cool moment for a player who was like, I don't have to just kill all these things. I could solve this problem in a different way. Sure. And so uh, that was very neat. Over time, he did succeed with that. He tamed that wolf. The players killed all of the other wolves. And then they had this door with a bright green glowing handle. And pretty much all the players said, well, I'm not going to touch that. Some of the players started to look at this last wolf and be like, well, we should probably kill that. And Sorrel was like, hey, it's my pet. Don't kill my pet wolf. I am the wolf lord. He tried to tame multiple wolves and didn't go so well, so he's probably not a wolf lord yet, but he definitely has a wolf pet. Uh, this will give us an opportunity, by the way, in future videos to talk about my feelings on the Beastmaster Ranger and regular individuals fighting with pets and what that could look like. Uh, I have some maybe slightly controversial thoughts about it, but uh, we'll see. We'll cover that in future videos if we come to that, if he ends up taming this wolf and trying to figure out how to work with it and issue commands, things like that. So, bright green, glowing, ominous door handle uh, and then a door sitting in front of them. And so, Sorel reaches out and opens the door with his hand, just puts his hand on the door and opens it. Um, he has to make a saving throw, rolls very poorly, uh, takes a little bit of damage, and then is poisoned for the next hour. So that is a bummer for him, but it was sort of telegraphed super hard. Uh, there is the same trap coming up in the next session. We'll see how they handle that a second time around, but more on that later. Next, they walk into this uh, larger room, and there are sort of portcullises on the other end of it where monsters could be let out, and there's like a pile of rubble and bodies, and I let them know, you know, there were several other people who tried this evaluation and clearly failed, putting on, the, on their minds that death is a possibility in this evaluation. It's not a closed environment situation. Um, and that this room would be harder than the last room. And indeed it was. Uh, in my notes, I had had for six uh, fifth level players, I had had two boulets, two carrion crawlers, and an owl bear. And I realized after how much they were banged up by the wolves, that was probably too much. So I scaled it back, I released some of these creatures one at a time, I made it only one boule, one boule, two carrion crawlers, and an owl bear, and I sort of doled them out in stages so it wasn't all four of them at once. Uh, that would have been really devastating for the party. So uh, if, if the players get to encounter something one-on-one -on -one or uh, two-on, you know, not one, two on six, then it's a lot easier for them to chip, like whittle this down really quick, burst this down, and then focus on the next thing. So that is what ended up happening. Uh, got to bust out my cool painted owlbear mini. That was a lot of fun. Uh, they killed it right away, of course. And after briefly joking about taming that one, they didn't choose to try that. But um, so yeah, we had this this combat bust out. Uh, one of my players was hiding behind this rubble play, rubble pile. It was the, the rogue, Varus, was hiding behind this rubble pile. It was a great place to, to shoot and, and fight things. And then at the end of his turn, these carrion crawlers burst out and attacked him. And he realized his positioning was maybe not ideal and then ran away. And that was a cool element of the fight. Uh, the boule ended up being incredibly terrifying, obviously, as the biggest and scariest monster out there. Um, Azarin was sort of separated off by herself and there was this burrowing and rumbling and outburst this land shark looking thing and attacked her 
Now here's where dice come into play, y'all, because the first attack I make with this boule, I roll, and it's a 20. And I have the briefest thought of, oh, that's kind of devastating for the first attack to be a 20, right? That's, that's a bummer. I'll, I'll probably knock it down. It's like, no. They have another cleric, and it's part of the dice, right? As things happen. Natural 20s happen. So this boule with 4d12 plus 4, I think, um, it has a huge damage. And the way that I do crits is uh, whatever dice that you would have rolled are automatically maximized and then you roll them and add your modifiers. So it ended up doing like 71 points of damage which outright dropped her to zero. And if I used massive damage, it probably would have killed her outright, but I don't really use massive damage in that way. If I were to use massive damage, it would be things like, I'm not even gonna roll damage for this because you're dead. If you jump off a 10,000 foot cliff, you're just dead. I don't care what character you are, unless you have a spell like slow fall, you just die. Uh, if you are a first level character and you swim in lava, you're dead, giving your character sheet. There's no point in rolling dice, you just died. Um, so I, that's how I would use massive damage. I don't use it in this way where a monster who is totally normal and reasonable for you to be fighting against just happens to roll really well when you're at kind of low hit points. I don't use them that way. But anyways, 71 points of damage when they all have roughly 40 to 50 hit points maximum uh, was terrifying for the players. She went down right away. They ended up turning, focusing on this thing. Uh, the bear cleric, played by Jared, uh, dragged Azarin away, healed her up, uh, made sure that she was safe, and they dealt with that encounter pretty well. Then the players opted to take a short rest. They were all pretty beat up and said, you know what, this evaluation is being timed and the faster the better, but I would rather complete this evaluation alive than complete it quickly but die. So that was their thought process, which I think is incredibly reasonable. And they're taking a short rest, spend some hit dice, heal up a little bit. Uh, the warlocks will get their spells back. The monk will get all his key back. So uh, that is where they sort of left it. We had to sort of cut session short because of real life scheduling difficulties. I had more planned. We'll get into all of that next time. But uh, that's where we left things. So we got to introduce the players to some combat. Uh, during the short rest, Walter tried to get a little role play going and was like, hey, so where's everybody from? Why are you guys here? And got sort of the cold shoulder from everybody. So I made sure to go to Walter after the fact and say, hey, great job. That was really good. I appreciate you trying to get role playing started. Don't give up. Sometimes it's hard for new players to get in the mindset of that. Keep asking those questions. Ask them of NPCs, ask them of PCs. That was great. I want to make sure that if I see behavior in a player that I like, I reward it. That is how you make good players. Good players are not born, they are made by DMs. I will say that again for emphasis. Good players are not just born out of the Ethereum. They are made. Good DMs will reinforce behavior that they like. If you like it when a player is prepared, let them know that you appreciate how prepared they are. Let them know that's important to you. If you like when a player will search for hidden whatevers, make sure there are hidden treasures that they can find, cool magic items. If you like behavior in a player, reward it. I like when a player is trying to get conversation and role play going outside of what is absolutely necessary. So I wanted to tell him, good job, well done. So I'm just going to go through now and talk about what the specific things were I was trying to do with this session, what beats I was trying to hit, what lessons I was trying to teach, all that stuff. So I wanted to make sure I set up the central tension and got to have a narrative introduction with the players. So that was that first opening scene was just talking about what would this war seem like to normal folk and how would they respond and react to it, as well as the idea of what are you going to do about this conflict, specifically addressing that to the players. What are you going to do about this? Then we jump into getting them to introduce themselves, get comfortable with, okay, I'm going to describe myself, I'm going to talk about who I am, where I'm from. I made sure to do that first with that NPC, Andreas, and sort of set it up for them so they would have an idea, an example of somebody else doing that. Then I wanted to introduce the raptors, and I wanted them to hate the raptors, which, by the way, I succeeded in, because I want them to have this idea of a rivalry. You know, there will, they'll have enemies in, in other circumstances, but I wanted them to have a rivalry specifically with somebody who was clearly stronger than they were to see how they interact with positions of power that they don't like 
and they can't really uh, deal with. How are you going to interface with uh, this? It's a conundrum I wanted to address. Um, and I think I, I did a pretty good job of setting it up as people that they are going to hate because they really did. They did not like people condescending to them from the get-go. They didn't like the attitude that the Raptors had for good reason. The Raptors were jerks. Next, I want to jump into some very simple combats and simple traps. Obvious problems, obvious solutions, and just say, okay, this is sort of the flow of D&D. &D. For the brand new players and for the people who haven't played all summer, this is what d and is about. This is what d and is like. Let's get all back on the same page. I want to do that for me. I haven't run combat in months. I ran one one-shot over the summer. I meant to do more. Schedule didn't allow it. It's one of the reasons why more videos didn't happen. The schedule didn't allow it. But I wanted to run more combats and didn't this summer, so I was a little out of practice. I wanted to run some simple stuff. And, by the way, I failed at that. I basically entirely forgot about their NPC, Andreas, Stonebreaker. Um, I I forgot to run him in combat for most of the time, so I wanted to set him up as this like leader, likable figure that they would be able to work with, and I totally failed because I didn't even run him, and I didn't even set that up, and so I'm going to try to remedy that uh, early next session um, from the get-go, uh, start things off there strong uh, with maybe making him a little more likable in that short rest, so stay tuned for that. So then in terms of general things that I've been working on as a DM, I want to make sure that I am more descriptive in combat. Um, I'm asking players uh, more questions about description and things like that in combat. I oftentimes get very much into like, okay, combat is numbers time, and I don't like doing that, and my players don't like it when that happens, so I'm trying to be more intentional about describing things. I would love it if the players started to do that, but a lot of them are new, and I know I need to set the tone, set the example, so I'm going to do a lot of it, and then over the coming weeks, I'm going to start to ask them, would you like to describe this attack? And sort of get them more used to uh, these descriptions and things like that in combat. Specifically, I want to make sure I describe conditions to players really well. I, I heard uh, several points of feedback from different players last campaign that the things that they remembered most were the conditions that I described to them very effectively. Like if it was a petrification, they could feel it crawling up their skin and the gray flakes of stone on their arm as it moved up and paralyzed their whole body. Um, other things like being charmed by, by a vampire and the way that their mind shifted and worked. And those kinds of conditions had lasting effects on players because they were described so well. So I tried to do that specifically with the poison of the door handle that uh, Sorel touched as as well as the paralysis effect of the carrion crawlers that ended up grabbing somebody. So um, those were things that I tried to make sure that I did really well um, when I was uh, running combat this time. I also, in, in general, want to make sure that there was more in-character role-playing. Last time, because of just the makeup of the players that we had, there wasn't a ton of in-character role-playing. And I didn't have a lot of NPCs that I could inject into the role-playing situation to make it happen more. So I want to be able to do that more. I want to be able to have uh, more NPCs that are more animated, and I can interact with players more and get them started with role-playing to encourage them to do it. Uh, I think it's really fun. The players that I have all talked to in my group, they all think it's really fun. They want to be able to do it. I think some of them just need an example, a jump start, and I would love to give that to them. I also have been doing something more that I've seen Matt Colville do a lot, and it's asking very specific questions of players to draw out how they are thinking and feeling about a situation and how their character is. So asking the monk player as he's taking a short rest and he's meditating, what does your meditation look like to other people? Other people are sitting around a room, they're all resting. What does your meditating look like? Is that something silent that's just happening to you? Are you doing an overt ritual or ceremony about it? What does it look like? And that's getting the monk player, Jason, to think about what, 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 what does meditation look like? What would this guy uh, sort of think and process? How would that uh, work and what would it look like? And I think that is, those kinds of questions are really important. What does your character feel about this? What is obvious to the other characters about how you're processing this situation? All kinds of things like that where you get the player to get into their own character's head by the questions you're asking them. So those are some of the things that I have been working on in specific and in general. I'm really looking forward to the next session. We're going to finish up this combat evaluation. They're going to find out their results and how well they did. They're going to meet their mission handler and they're going to get their first assignment. So there will be uh, some role playing, some negotiation and a lot of planning. They're going to have a whole bunch of planning because I'm going to give them a mission. It's going to be incredibly open 
ended. Here is your mission. You have to do this, but how you do it is entirely up to you. And so the players will get a chance to think strategically as opposed to just tactically while they're in combat. Think strategically. How do we want to accomplish this mission? What are ways in which we can leverage our own strengths and shore up our own weaknesses by our planning? So really looking forward to next week and seeing how the players do with all of that. Uh, thank you guys for jumping back into this brand new campaign with me and watching along, following along with the story. I uh, hope you guys are learning learning lessons from me, learning from my mistakes, learning from my successes. That's the whole point of this channel is for me to be able to share what I have been doing, what works, what doesn't work, and for you to be able to steal ideas. Nobody's ever heard of me, so feel free to rip off all of my ideas, take everything of mine. Your players will have uh, no idea that you've done any of that, and you'll look really smart. Or if my ideas are terrible, you'll look really dumb, so don't steal those ideas. But anyways, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time. Ah, I took a drink of water and splashed myself in the eye. Ooh.